Our new study looks at how different levels of warming influences the vulnerability of Antarctic ice shelves to atmospherically driven collapse. We find three main things. Firstly, more warming leads to more melting, which eventually collects on the surface and begins to run off, which indicates vulnerability and destabilization. Second, at four degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, a scenario we look set to achieve with current emissions by the end of the century, around 34% of Antarctic ice shelves could be susceptible to destabilization. Lastly, we identify the Larsen Sea, Wilkins, Pine Island and Shackleton ice shelves to be most at risk. This study concerns Antarctic ice shelves, the floating extensions of the Antarctic ice sheet formed when glaciers flow off the steep terrain of the Antarctic continent and meet the ocean. We're thinking about the surface mass balance of those ice shelves and the surface mass balance is the balance between what comes in in terms of ice and what goes out at the surface of the ice shelf. And that is predominantly influenced by the atmosphere. So here we're not considering iceberg carving, dynamical changes, ocean melting, this kind of thing. We're purely thinking about changes and effects at the surface. Several ice shelves in recent decades have undergone dramatic mass loss and collapse events, which has been linked to a process called hydrofracturing, where water cracks ice shelves and causes them to disintegrate. Hydrofracturing is a really important process for ice shelves, and it goes something like this. In the summer, you get melting at the surface of the ice shelf. And initially, that meltwater can trickle down and refreeze in the buffering fern layer, which is a dense snow layer that is porous and acts like a sponge. Over time, if the rate of snowfall to replenish that fern is smaller than the amount of melt produced, the fern layer becomes saturated with refrozen meltwater. That means that the next season, when melt is produced, it has nowhere to go and collects on the surface or runs into existing crevasses and cracks on the ice shelf. Now, water weighs a lot, so once those crevasses start to be filled up, they get widened and deepened and eventually reach the bottom of the ice shelf and cause the entire thing to disintegrate quite spectacularly. That is exactly what happened over the Larsen B ice shelf in 2002, which collapsed in relatively catastrophic fashion over about two months. Without an ice shelf to hold them back, the glaciers that formerly fed the shelf are able to flow unrestricted into the ocean, and that is what causes sea level rise. We're looking at the susceptibility of Antarctic ice shelves to this process at various levels of warming that are still possible this century. 1.5, 2 and 4 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. This is a modelling study using state-of-the-art high-resolution regional climate modelling forced with global climate projections from IPCC class models. So here we're looking at the difference between the historical period from 1980 to 2009 and mean conditions at each increment of warming. And this is the mean of all the simulations. Cool colours indicate less melt and runoff and higher surface mass balance than historical and warm colours indicate the opposite, more melt and runoff and lower surface mass balance. So at one and a half degrees, we can see that melt and runoff increase over ice shelves and that surface mass balance increases a bit, mostly not over ice shelves. And this is because precipitation increases, especially over mountainous terrain. We see the same picture at two degrees approximately, just slightly intensified. But at four degrees, there is quite a stark difference. The increase in melt and runoff relative to the historical period is quite large. And this causes quite a significant decline in surface mass balance over ice shelves. This suggests that changes are non-linear, so melt increases at four degrees are not simply equivalent to double the melt increases we see at two degrees. Now, if we look at figure two, we can also see this kind of non-linearity. And here we want to look at the circles, which are the mean values. And we're looking here in this figure at the totals for all the ice shelves in figure one. We see that increases are steady from the historical period to 1.5 and then two degrees, but that there's a steep increase between two and four degrees of warming. 
All of these markers, I should say, are different model simulations. So think of it as different parallel futures. We also see much less agreement between models at four degrees than we do at lower increments of warming. So as the future progresses, the picture becomes much less clear. In figure three, we're zooming in on runoff to think about which ice shells might be more susceptible to disintegration. This figure shows how much of the total ice shelf area is experiencing runoff and so vulnerable. And we break this down into regions. Here, you want to look at the black line for the average and the gray area gives you a spread of results. For the whole of Antarctica, the area of ice shells vulnerable to destabilization increases non-linearly as a result of those runoff increases. This mostly comes from the Antarctic Peninsula initially, of one and a half and two degrees, but then increasingly the East Antarctic. Most of the way through, West Antarctica contributes little, which is consistent with our understanding that the majority of mass loss in West Antarctica is driven by ocean melting. But it's not just the area of ice shelves that may be vulnerable that increases. The number of days per year where runoff occurs increases too. Each model future is shown, but we can focus on the multi-model mean for four degrees to give us a good picture. The largest increases in runoff duration are seen on the Antarctic Peninsula, especially the Larsen C, Wilkins and George VI ice shelves. There's also the Roy Baudouin, Amory, Shackleton and Pine Island glaciers that are worth looking at. So we see increased runoff amount, extent and duration, all pointing to the fact that more warming leads to higher risk of ice shelf destabilization. On the Antarctic Peninsula at four degrees of warming, up to 67% of ice shelf area is vulnerable to destabilization. Limiting warming to two degrees instead of four degrees of our pre-industrial temperatures will halve the area of Antarctic ice shelves susceptible to collapse. I should add a qualifier that these are probably upper end estimates and if you're interested in why, you can read that in our paper.